In part one, we are discussing some of the major misconceptions of the cosmological arguments which permeate modern philosophical conversation. Just to remind you, these consisted first of the insertion of the premise, everything has a cause, into the argument, even though no such premise is actually found within the theological tradition. Secondly, the claim that the argument is a God of the gaps argument, as though the theist is proposing some sort of scientific hypothesis, which temporarily serves as the best explanation of some evidence in the probabilistic sense. What we seek to do instead is reason from general features of experience to that which has a nature which is uncaused in a very clear, logical fashion. This mode of deductive reasoning means that if the premises are true and the argument is formally valid, then a conclusion necessarily follows. It also means that we reason to the only possible conclusion, and we're not proposing a scientific hypothesis which can be overturned given some new scientific finding. This is very much like how a theorem in mathematics is not a scientific hypothesis, which claims to be the best explanation of the empirical evidence, and might in principle be overturned when new evidence comes in. For example, when I prove that the square root of 2 is not a rational number, I'm not hypothesizing that it's irrational as the best explanation of the quote, decimal expansion empirical evidence, unquote, which could be overturned 50 years from now when new decimal expansion evidence comes in. I'm saying it cannot fail to be true and it is certain knowledge. In the same way, when I say it's impossible to trisect an angle with ruler and compass, I'm not giving an empirical hypothesis along the lines of no one has ever been able to do it, but we might have to change our mind when new geometrical evidence comes in. I'm saying it's absolutely impossible and can never be done. The classical arguments for God's existence should be thought of as closer to proving a mathematical theorem than giving a scientific hypothesis. And because the classical theist isn't giving a scientific hypothesis, New individual results from the empirical sciences have nothing to say one way or the other. They don't make the case for classical theism, and they don't make the case for atheism. Finally, we also dealt with the classic atheist question, who made God? To add to what I said last time, the atheist actually betrays two things by asking this question. Firstly, the power of the infinite regress to undermine an argument. And secondly, the desire to reach the most fundamental, that which accounts for everything else. This mentioning of the most fundamental leads me to the primary topic of this video, the distinction between uppercase G God and the lowercase g gods. You'll remember I introduced this distinction in part zero, and I think it's an important one, for the failure to make such a distinction result in both sides talking past one another. Instead of talking about pure act or actus purus, that which ultimately allows for there to be any actualizations of potentials, and therefore any change in the world at all. What often happens in popular discourse is that both sides end up debating whether there exists a souped-up version of a human being, or a cosmic superhero, or a distinguished character perhaps named Mr. God, who represents an exceptionally well-behaved gentleman. The fault cannot be placed only on atheists for thinking along these lines. For many popular theists, such as Alvin Plantinga and William Lane Craig, do essentially have this view of God, where God is supposedly the most exalted member of the class named person. Now, the classical theistic tradition would reject the very idea that God is a person, not to be confused with God being personal. And classical theists often call this flavor of theism espoused by Plantinga and Craig theistic personalism. It should be noted that this theistic personalism has not been the mainstream in classical theological thought, and I think there are good reasons for thinking it's incorrect. In a way, I cannot fault atheists for failing to be convinced of this view of God as being another instantiation of the category person, for it does seem excessively anthropomorphic. I claim there is something more being designated by the uppercase G besides swapping one symbol for another, and it's most certainly not designating a proper name, as though by talking about the prime mover we're talking about some being among other beings who just so happens to have the name prime mover. The classical theist here is trying to get at something else, and in my opinion, it has to do with the absolute dependency of everything upon this most metaphysically prior reality, as opposed to pointing out an isolated, limited local power, like what one of the Greek gods, lowercase g, represents. Now, the natures of these two categories, to use that word in a loose sense, appropriately reflect each in that the uppercase g god, so the classical theist argues, has no potencies, no materiality, no corporeality, nor any composition of parts, or anything that would cry out for a prior cause to quote-unquote metaphysically assemble this god, as it were. On the other hand, the lowercase g gods are changeable, they're material, corporeal, natural objects, which certainly cry out for a prior cause to metaphysically assemble these lowercase g gods. 
So the atheist is perfectly entitled, given that these lowercase g gods have a nature that cries out for a prior cause or prior explanation, who made these lowercase g gods. But given the divine nature of the uppercase g god, which has nothing which demands of a prior cause, asking who made the first principle makes a little sense, as I have argued before. So uppercase g god represents absolute metaphysical primacy and properly deserves the names first cause and first principle, whereas the lowercase g gods absolutely do not merit the name first cause. The only thing they merit is being called cosmic superheroes. What's odd about this in modern conversation is that the classical theist likely agrees with the atheist on their main contention, that there aren't any of these cosmic superheroes. On the other hand, we describe uppercase g god by saying things like pure actuality, or ground of being, or as St. Thomas Aquinas says, subsistent act of existence itself, or ipsum esse subsistens in Latin, meaning that whose essence or quiddity just is existence itself. Now that's contrasted with essence and existence being distinct in most other things, in that saying what a thing is does not of itself communicate that it is. The act of existence in a man, for example, is conjoined to what a man is, that is, his essence or quiddity, simply to exist as a man in the here and now, or any other moment for that matter. To emphasize not in the distant past, but right here and right now, active existence must be joined to quiddity. To give you a taste of how someone like a Thomist would conclude that there must be ipsum esse subsistence, that whose essence or quiddity just is his active existence, instead of merely being some idea or an abstraction in the intellect, we begin by saying that in something like a man, in which essence is distinct from existence, an act of existence must be joined to essence, just for the man to exist at all. The man cannot do this on his own, for such would be logically impossible. He would have to give himself existence, something which he does not already have. To put it another way, he would have to exist before he exists, to make himself exist. So the Thomist would say that something else, not the essence of the man itself, must cause an act of existence to be joined to that man's essence in the here and now. But you'll notice that of this additional thing, we should also ask whether it too has an essence or quiddity distinct from its existence. If not, we have our conclusion. There must be that in which essence is not distinct from existence. If the two are distinct, it too just to exist at all in here and now, or any moment at which it may exist, must also have a cause of its act of existence being joined to its essence. Now, the Thomist says this series of causes cannot proceed to infinity. Why is that? This sort of causal series is another example of a series ordered essentially, or per se, which we discussed last time. Remember, members in these sorts of series only possess a certain power because they receive it from the previous member. That is, they only have power to do certain things derivatively, such as actualized potentials, as we saw in the argument from motion, or the argument from change. Here, each member in this series of things conjoining acts of existence to essence can only do such a thing because it too is being caused to exist by the previous, through its act of existence being joined to an essence. For if the previous member stopped doing such a thing, the member in question wouldn't be able to do much of anything, for it wouldn't even exist to get the chance. Just as we saw in the argument from change or motion, Suppression of previous members would result in the failure of latter members in the series. Here, they would just drop out of existence. Therefore, this series must terminate with a most fundamental member. You might call it a first member if you insist, but remember, first here means most fundamental, not first in a temporal sense. This has nothing to do with Big Bang cosmology, so don't even bring that to mind. Now, this first member cannot be just like the others, in which essence is distinct from existence, thus requiring an act of existence joined to an essence, once again. For if that were true, then there would have to be a more fundamental cause, thus contradicting this being the first or most fundamental member in the series. Therefore, we conclude that in this most fundamental member, essence is in fact not distinct from existence. It's the same. That's the sketch how we arrive at ipsum esse subsistence, argued by St. Thomas. In the previous video, I argued for the existence of an unactualized actualizer, or pure act. And I claim that ipsum esse subsistence is also pure act. There are just two different ways of describing that most metaphysically fundamental reality. One through the lens of act potency, and the other through the lens of essence existence. But the essence and existence are very much related by potency and act, as we discussed last time. In that essence all by itself 
is only in potency and requires actualization to truly exist. So just like things which are in motion, which have certain potentials being actualized, essences represent a sort of potency which must also be brought to actuality. Now in ipsum esse, there cannot be any such potencies, for if there were, ipsum esse wouldn't really be the subsistent act of existence itself, because it's not really subsistent, for it, like most other things, would need some potency actualized just to exist. Therefore, subsistent existence itself cannot have any potencies, and therefore exists in a purely actual way, or just is actuality itself. Therefore, that which is subsistent existence itself is also pure act. Two different ways of talking about the same thing. And because it's pure act, it's also going to inherit all of those other attributes that I defended in the last video, such as unity, there being only one ipsum esse in principle, as opposed to 500 different ones. It's going to be eternal, it's going to be immaterial, etc. Notice that this argument, just like the argument for motion, has nothing whatsoever to do with the distant past. It also has nothing to do with whether the universe began to exist, or whether it's eternal. For even if it were eternal, the argument would still have to be answered, since we're talking about the here and now in this argument. It does not say that everything needs a cause, for what it says, if we actually pay attention to the premises, is that that in which essence is distinct from existence needs a cause. And precisely because essence is distinct from existence that it requires a cause. As I said last time, the premise everything has a cause is not a premise in any cosmological argument any respected theologian or philosopher has ever made. Now, if Stefan Molyneux says, not an argument, please permit me to say, hashtag, not a premise, in regards to this ghost premise, everything has a cause. And no, subsistent existence itself cannot be identical with the universe, taken as a whole, unless you're prepared to concede that the universe is immaterial and immutable. Furthermore, it cannot be a mere abstraction like a law of nature, whatever that's supposed to mean when we precisely define what a law of nature is especially not as Newton or Descartes saw them, which were things reflecting God's will, the deus volt theory of laws of nature, if you will. And it makes no sense to even raise the question of what causes subsistent existence itself to exist. For if there were a cause, subsistent existence itself wouldn't really be subsistent. Again, a popular question which sounds like a devastating objection just turns out to be as silly as the question, what changes that which is immutable and cannot even in principle be changed? We saw that the unactualized actualizer represents the singular ultimate source of all change of those things in our daily experience which are composed of act and potency. What subsistent existence itself represents is the singular ultimate source for the existence and continued existence of all the things of our daily experience in the here and now. And the things of our daily experience require such a sustaining cause precisely because their essence or quiddity is distinct from their existence. Again, what a thing is does not communicate that it is. In summary, because what the things of our daily experience are does not entail that they are, there must be that in which what it is is the same as that it is, the great I am, if you catch my drift. And this is indeed, as St. Thomas Aquinas might say, et hoc dicimus deum. This is what we call God, uppercase G, that is. What I'd like to drive home here is the absolute metaphysical primacy of subsistent existence itself which is not characteristic of the lowercase g gods. There are a number of ways to see that subsistent existence itself has little to do with the lowercase g gods. First, the lowercase g gods are local discrete powers within nature, but not metaphysically fundamental, owing their existence to other conditions that must be in place. These clearly, then, cannot be ipsum esse. That is, they exist insofar as they are in a pantheon, or a power within nature, but do not exist of themselves in the absolutely subsistent way that subsistent existence itself does. In general, that which just isn't most metaphysically fundamental, which entails its being pure act and being ipsum esse, just isn't what the classical theist, or even the atheist who's asking who made God is talking about here in our, in our quest for the most fundamental. Secondly, we saw that in part one that pure act is immutable and incorporeal both because to be otherwise would presuppose certain potencies presence within something which is pure act, which is contradictory. On the other hand, the lowercase g gods are corporeal beings which are ruled over by their irrational passions, and therefore change over time. Therefore, these pagan gods just aren't candidates for being pure act, or subsistent existence itself. They're not even in the same ballpark, to confuse the two as a category error. Thirdly, the distinction between subsistent existence itself and, quote, the gods, is also made quite clear by the numbers of such things. 
pure act being unified, the latter being multiple in principle. It could make sense to talk about 50 distinct lowercase g gods, but it makes absolutely no sense, not even in principle, to talk about more than one subsistent act of existence itself, or pure act. For there are no ways in which more than one could be distinguished, such as a potency that one has that the other does not have. On this point of the numbers of lowercase g gods, one often hears atheists saying that they believe in one less god than you. Now, this has some air of plausibility until we clarify the issue and recall we're talking about pure act, or subsistent existence itself here. Therefore, this witticism in the realm of classical theism really translates to saying, I believe in one less pure act than you. Or, I just go one subsistent act of existence itself further than you. Or, you reject all those other grounds of being, don't you? Great. I just go one ground of being further than you. Or, I'm an atheist with respect to all those other most fundamental realities. None of these questions or statements really has the same rhetorical power, and in fact, it makes this witticism seem rather silly, since if there is uppercase G God, there's only one such thing in principle, not 50 different ones, like the lowercase G Gods. If the atheist here is talking about lowercase G Gods, it's totally irrelevant, since the classical theist can agree with the atheist in that there are zero lowercase G Gods. So if this locution of one less God makes any sense, the atheist isn't really saying to the classical theist that he believes in one less local power or cosmic superhero than the classical theist. What he's really saying is that he denies that there's an absolute source of all change in the world, and he denies there is an ultimate ground for being and intelligibility. That notion concerning the most fundamental is what this whole debate is really about. Not trying to figure out how many cosmic superheroes or a distinguished gentleman named Mr. God there are. So the atheist is actually saying something quite radical if he denies the very source for not only change in the world, but also the ground for there being any contingent thing at all. If there is no pure act, there is no ultimate source of motion, and the question of why any potentials are actualized in the here and now is left mysterious. And we're left with the absurdity that things possess motive power derivatively, but ultimately derive such a power from nothing at all. So atheism seems to have within it the potential for total absurdity. And we see this here when thinking about change which is an undeniable aspect of the most mundane experience. Atheism, therefore, isn't a benign intellectual position of the same significance as, say, putting on a different color t-shirt. Atheism, if taken seriously, blows out the metaphysical foundations for understanding key parts of reality, such as the cause of existence of the things of our daily experience existing at any moment at all, or the very possibility that they could change. The atheist who denies this is simply unaware of or unwilling to draw out the metaphysical consequences of his position. When it comes to metaphysics, atheism is much more cancerous than most atheists realize. But I should also emphasize that what the classical theist isn't saying is that there is indeed a pantheon, but there's only one lowercase g god within it. What the classical theist is saying is that there is a unified, absolutely simple divine nature, which is much more fundamental than the pantheon itself, or any of its members, and allows for the possibility of there being a pantheon at all, or for there to be any of the lowercase g gods at all, even a possibility. So the classical theist is not what David Bentley Hart calls a monopolytheist, in the sense he's asserting that there are these local powers, the lowercase g gods, but there just so happens to be one such power. He's saying that there is a most metaphysically fundamental reality upon which even the lowercase g gods depend. Even the pagan lowercase g gods, if they were to exist, are dependent on pure actuality to actualize any potentials, or upon subsistent existence itself to exist by joining an act of existence to an essence, just like in most other things. As a side note, you can see here why the terms monotheism and polytheism are actually potentially confusing terms, since if you're a classical theist, you're not a monotheist in the sense you think there's one limited local power, as opposed to 20. Rather, you think that there is a first principle from which all of the powers and existences are derived. To paraphrase David Bentley Hart, the lowercase g gods, qualitatively speaking, are no less ontologically impoverished than anything else in our daily experience. The classical theist is trying to push things back as far as they possibly go, and not settling for any derivative realities like pantheons or the gods. He's trying to get at that which is the most fundamental and see what comes out of this line of questioning. One example being pure actuality, as we've already seen in the argument for motion, and ipsum esse subsistence in the Thomistic argument. So if the thing you're talking about, like, quote, the gods, is dependent upon other things to be the way it is, such as needing other gods to give birth to it, or is changing over time, which indicates the actualization of a potential, or even needs some parcel of matter conjoined to form, or having a body, you haven't yet reached rock bottom, and you're not yet talking about uppercase g god or the absolute. 
Since there is a difference in kind and not in degree between lowercase g god and uppercase g god, you haven't even gotten close to talking about god, uppercase g, as understood in the classical theistic tradition, as that most metaphysically fundamental reality. Now, this is the rather unfortunate state of discourse nowadays, where atheists aren't even talking about the same thing that serious theists are, even though certainly much ink has been spilled on atheism in terms of books and lectures. Instead of becoming wiser and looking to the past, to thinkers such as Plato, Aristotle, Plotinus, St. Augustine, Avicenna, St. Anselm, St. Thomas, and others have had to say about God. 90% of the time in our modern hubris believing that we understand, whereas we're actually lost at sea, we're working under the pretense that we're both discussing whether uppercase G God exists or not. Whereas what we're actually doing, both theist and atheist, is debating how many cosmic superheroes or lowercase G Gods there are. As I've been saying, the classical theist and the atheist share a common sentiment when the atheist asks, who made God? And that, that which emerges from our reasoning must be truly fundamental, and be congruous with it being the most fundamental. In the argument from change, the prime mover indeed has a nature of being pure act, which is congruous with being the most fundamental. Supposing we messed up in our reasoning and added some potencies to the prime mover, the atheist would indeed be titled to ask, what actualizes this alleged prime mover, precisely because those things which are mixtures of act and potency require actualization. Whereas asking what actualizes the potentials and that which has no potentials to be actualized, even in principle, becomes not only a silly question, but the indicator that we've reached rock bottom in our analysis of change and tracing it back to first principles, reasoning from effect back to first cause. The same goes for the essence-existence distinction in the Thomistic argument. Our line of reasoning went as far back as it could go, and reason leads us to conclude that there exists that which just is subsistent existence itself. At which point, it makes absolutely no sense to ask what caused that which is subsistent to exist. Again, the classical theist pushes things back as far as they can possibly go. I understand I'm being a little bit harsh with the atheists here, and I apologize for it, but I encourage them to draw out the consequences of their positions. With that in mind, in the next few videos, we're going to mention, at least a few times, a very nice author, Alex Rosenberg, who wrote a book named The Atheist's Guide to Reality, in which he does precisely this. He beautifully draws out the consequences of the atheistic and naturalistic worldview. I thank you for your time, and I hope you'll join me for part three in this series.